Hello, everyone. We're live. Can you hear me? Is audio working? Hey, Philip. Can somebody tell me, is audio working? It looks like audio might be working. Awesome. That's great news. We are live. If everybody can remember to like the stream, it helps the stream to get attention. We've got questions. I hope everybody had a great Thanksgiving. <clears throat> okay. You hit me. I don't see every question. I really don't. It's uh, like, oh, thank you, Eagle. I hope you had a great Thanksgiving, too. All right. So, Philip uh, Morning, what is asking a question here? It says, in a lot of your videos, you talk about the defense counsel and how they are always happy to charge a ton of money per hour to help employers defend themselves. I wanted to ask about a situation where the employer is very large, pocketed, and has a large in-house legal office. Ask away. I'm just waiting. I think Philip is typing, and I'm waiting for the rest of the question. <clears throat> so Philip goes on. Would there be cases where the in-house lawyers recommend hiring outside defense lawyers? <clears throat> and he continues, I'd love to hear some thoughts about how large employers with large in-house legal offices may strategize differently from one which has to hire outside counsel to defend itself. So, Phil, uh, it is rare. I'm not going to say it doesn't happen, but it is rare that in-house counsel would handle a federal litigation. Generally speaking, um, if you're a very large entity, so we'll use we'll use Meta. We'll use Meta as an example because I know uh, I know personally they have um, a position that's like director of employment litigation. They're hiring for it desperately, nonstop. They're always trying to get more people to be directors of employment litigation. And that person probably guides some associates and they probably handle like EEOC charges and some state issues. And they probably do things similar to like Eric Sarver, who you've seen on our channel. Um, you can watch his videos. He does a lot of compliance work, like planning on how the company is going to comply with the laws of all the jurisdictions. And in the case of Meta, all the countries they do business in, right? And so like when Meta's hiring a director of employment litigation, they're, they're doing it generally on a country by country basis. Now there's certainly going to be, listen, if you're in the Balkans, you, you might cover multiple countries laws, right? If you're, if you're the director of employment litigation, you might be dealing it, you know, multiple countries at the same time. But um, generally speaking, you know, if you're being hired as a director of employment litigation for a multinational and you're being hired in the U.S., you're probably just dealing with employment litigation in the U.S. And they're probably going to be dealing with um, the initial complaints, in-house um, efforts to avoid employment litigation, state filings, agency filings, maybe some low-level arbitrations. But generally speaking, when a case goes to federal court for litigation, I would say 95, 96, maybe 99 times out of 100. They're going to hire outside counsel. And that's true for almost any entity. That's true for giant universities. It's true for giant corporations. I will I will say this, though. I know for a fact, like IBM, when uh, when their old CEO, Ginny, uh, took it upon herself to create a video in which she like openly stated that she wanted to engage in age discrimination. We need to promote millennials and, and get get our older workers out of their way, like this whole video spiel that generated so much age discrimination litigation that they ended up, um, I facetiously say they ended up buying me a farm, but, um, I'm kidding. I'm purely kidding. I would never say that. Um, but they ended up having to buy like almost like 
centers packed with employment attorneys because uh, they had so much employment litigation. It became almost un unfeasible to, to hire outside counsel. That's how much employment litigation they were engaged in. And that, that's a rare circumstance where that actually happens. But generally speaking, most employers are going to say, oh, geez, we have federal litigation in the field of employment law. We don't like keeping employment litigators on the staff. They're insane people. They're not good employees. They Even the defense counsel, they expect to make so much money. They drive us insane. Uh, just, just hire them when you need them, right? That's that's much more common. Um, so, you know, listen, it's possible, but it's it's rare. It's very rare that they would do that. Um, what do we have here? Eagle, I was happy to answer your question. I don't remember it, but I hope I gave you a good answer. Uh, Eagle has a question. Um, Eagle97 asked us, I do have a general non-employment law question. Do you believe that remote work saved the country and the world from economic collapse during the pandemic? And I just said the word pandemic, so I've now been demonetized. Um, you got me, Eagle. You got me. I'm kidding. It doesn't matter. Who cares? Um, what's an extra couple hundred bucks, right? Um, no, don't worry about it. Uh, so, I mean, listen, I'm not an economist. I appeared on a show with, uh, it's actually a podcast called the Words and Numbers Podcast. Tremendous duo. It's a political scientist and a um, and, and an economist, and they're very talented. Um, and I appeared on their show. We did not talk about that, but but that show, we, they're going to be much better at telling you what did and did not save the, the economy from collapse. I am an armchair economist at best. Um, I'm good enough to make videos being like, hey, in 18 months, you're going to have inflation problems. And like, you need to think about how your, your pension's not indexed for inflation and stuff like that. But but neither YouTube nor my my viewership likes it when I make those videos. People just get mad at me. And they're like, that will never happen. And then, then it happens. And People are like, I hate you for saying that would happen because you go like, will it to happen? It's like, that's not okay. <laughs> uh, Ray, why'd you delete your question? I was going to answer your question. If you delete it, I'll respect it. I won't answer it, but okay. Uh, Ray has reposted his question. Uh, Ray asks us, can a fired employee who has information on a case be considered a reliable witness to the jurors? I think so. I think you can absolutely establish the credibility of an employee who's been terminated. Um, in fact, I, I think the first move, and it's always going to be detail driven, right? Like a reliable person is a reliable person, an unreliable person, a person who seems like a liar is going to seem like a liar. Um, but listen, that's foundational for any witness, right? Like you're, you're building a foundation as to why the jurors should believe this person. And the other side's trying to poke holes in that foundation. Right, they're lobbing in grenades, cannonballs, trying to knock bricks out of your foundation. Right, like, oh, he beat his puppy in '87. Well, we don't know he beat his puppy, right? Yeah, like you end up with these like weird little fights about like, was it a puppy or was it a feral Rottweiler and he was saving a small child? Like, what? What are we? You know what I mean? Um, so, listen, I think you can absolutely. You can absolutely build the credibility of someone. The fact that they've been terminated doesn't mean that much to me, right? And listen, they're going to come out and be like, oh, we fired this person. This person is just angry. And my take on that is like, uh, that's a narrative. It's not the best narrative. Also, like, what were they fired for? Were they fired for attempted murder? Or were they fired for, for calling out too many times? You know, like, there's a big spectrum here, you know, or... or or conversely, were they fired because they were doing the right thing and everybody knew they were going to not stand for discrimination. And so they fired them because this person was too good of a person, right? I mean, listen, it's all about how you spin it a little bit. Akemi asked us, happy belated Thanksgiving, Vince, and, and belated Thanksgiving to you. What are the most common ways the plaintiffs with, le oh, with legitimate case can... Mess up. The, okay, this is a great question. Uh, Akemi asks us, what are the most common ways that plaintiffs with a legitimate case mess up their case? And also, I should be reading questions before I read them out loud. 
Like, <laughs> not very intelligent of me to just read things like it's a teleprompter. People can get me to say anything. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, there, there's definitely plaintiffs who don't listen to their attorneys. Um, there's plaintiffs who like believe, like th there's some people on the channel who are like, oh, give us case law, give us case law. You're worthless unless you give us case law. And then they'll also post things about like what the case law means that don't track and like are not stated correctly. So like, there's people who like overestimate their ability to work with the case law. Uh, I don't give case law on the channel because I don't believe people on the channel can work with case law. It's it's a difficult thing to do. It takes some training. Like pro se litigants are generally not going to have much success, uh, much success like dealing with the case law and structuring arguments based on uh, case law and precedent. Like that is probably one of the few things that you could argue like you actually need a tr training as an attorney to do in litigation. Um, so that that's common. There's a lot of plaintiffs who get the greedies, right? There's there's a lot of plaintiffs who are like, you're like, hey, Jake the plaintiff, I, I got an offer of 300K for you, but I think you should hold that for 500. I think I can get you 500. Just give me two more weeks. Like, I don't want you to take 300. I think I can get you 500K. And Jake the plaintiff's like, uh, or you could fuck yourself. I want 40 mil. And you're like, Jake, you wouldn't, you'd have, you'd have to live 200 years to earn 40 mil. Like that's a 200 year multiplier on your, your average yearly earnings. He's like, well, but, but I'm sad. Okay, Jake, the plaintiff, but you, you don't treat provincial health and, and you, you you don't talk about like, what are you talking about? Like, we can't substantiate that. Like you want 200 million emotional damages for what? Because, because somebody was mean to you. Like, I'm not saying there's not something there, but I am saying it's not 200 mil or whatever it is, 40 mil, whatever, whatever the, the number at that point gets ridiculous. And it's meaningless. Right. Um, so getting the greedies is like a major like thing that happens to plaintiffs. And it's one of those things where you just have to be like, okay, so like they're not going to give you that. We can try the case. Um, you're embracing the risk of trial, and then often uh, the person who had the greedies will like be two years down the line going to trial. And they're like, why don't I have money yet? Like, well, because you you refuse to take money. Like I I think I could have gotten you five hundred k two years ago, but uh, you said no. That's why you don't have money yet. And they're like, you're a bad attorney. You're bad. I should have my 40 mil by now. It's like, there is no 40 mil. Like the jury, even if you win, you're not getting 40 mil. Like that's not going to, that cannot happen. Realistically speaking, that cannot happen in your case. You do not have a $40 million case and you're engaging in self-harm by deluding yourself to believing that. That's, that's a big, that's a major misstep for plaintiffs that happens all the time. Regina, happy belated Thanksgiving to you as well. Uh, Philip asked another question. You did a recent video on asking to fire the boss, retaliated in mediation. What about asking for them to be demoted to a non-management role in the org so they're not bad to people again? Generally speaking, employers are not going to cut deals about the structure of their organization during settlement. I've seen it happen. I have seen it happen. It's rare, but it can happen. Um, I would say... I mean, listen, I hate putting probabilities on things, but like, I feel like every 30 times somebody asks for it, some employer's like, uh, we don't care. Fine. So for whatever it's worth, one out of 30 times it works. Uh, most of the time, it's just something like plaintiffs are like, I need this person to be fired or demoted, whatever. Employer's like, yeah, no. We'll give you money though. We, we agree. Your attorney looks a little scary. We agree. We'll give you money, but you know, you don't run our business. We're not interested in your thoughts on that. And part of that might just be to like, yeah, we're going to fire this person the minute this deal is over. Like that is fairly common. So they might be like, oh, I don't want to cut deals, but I don't want to demote the guy and then fire him. That's not great management. We're going to fire him when we're done. So why demote him now? You know, like that's, that's a tension that exists. Viral shedding zombie, great name. I I only see you saying memorandum of points and authorities. I know I know what that means in this context. Maybe I missed something else you said. 
Um, Eagle 97 has a question, which I will read before I read it out loud, because I'm learning. I'm learning. Uh, if everyone could remember to like the stream, it helps the stream to get attention. And, uh, you know, then people can ask more questions and we can answer more questions. Eagle 97 asks, would an employer claim that they hired an applicant under false pretenses if the newly hired employees then disclose the disability right, uh, disability right after being hired and request an accommodation? So I actually have a video on this Eagle 97. I recommend, let me take a sip of my coffee. So I actually have like a video of um, like how to go about applying for jobs if you have a disability that needs an accommodation. And my recommendation is get in there. Don't disclose your disability until you're hired. Like once you're fully hired, disclose your disability. Um, and then they can argue it's false pretenses, but the response to that is like, oh, so you're saying you wouldn't have hired me if I disclosed my disability up front? Because that sounds a lot like having a disability discrimination case. Only now that you actually hired me, I know that I can litigate this more successfully than a failure to hire claim. Failure to hire claims are tougher to win and worth less because they're a higher risk, right? There's a lot of people who apply for a job who don't get hired. So on a failure to hire claim, the employer can just be like, listen, we, we interviewed 300 people. We hired one. What do you want from us? It wasn't the disability. It just, he, this was one of the 299 people we didn't hire, right? Can you bring that case? Could that case have value? Sure, absolutely. But is, is it as good as, well, they hired me. I was the one out of 300 people they actually hired. And then I disclosed my disability and asked for an accommodation. And then they fired me. Well, that's a much better case, right? Like I was the guy, I'm the person, I'm the human being who got selected for the job. And then I said, hey, but I, I do need this one accommodation, which I have a right to under federal law and potentially state and local law as well. And then they fired me. So that's a way better case and something they're also probably going to be afraid to do if they're competent. So my recommendation is definitely don't disclose until you're hired, always. And listen, if they fire you, get that money, right? Uh, Noriega, it's good to see you. Thumbs up. Henry, uh, best believe, Henry, best believe that that's quite the username. Happy Turkey day to you as well. Thank you. Thank you for loving the channel. Um, I am trying to, oh, Henry's asking how often do you do the lives? I seem to miss them sometimes. Excuse me. So Henry, this year for the firm has been incredibly, incredibly busy. Um, so the lives have been a little hit or miss. Um, it's just something live. is just something I started doing this year and it's cool. Like, it's really cool to interact with people. I really enjoy interacting with people. I enjoy like going back and forth. Um, I'm really aware that the YouTube channel is like just me talking into the void. It's, it's really weird. Cause like, um, then I'll like sit down with people who like watch like a hundred hours of me talking and then they'll be like i feel like i know you and i'm like that's awesome but I, I don't know you and and that's a really weird interaction it's um i forgot the word for it hank green did a video on it uh oh parasocial relationships um where like one party gets to spend a lot of time listening to the other right there, there's two of us in this interaction there's you and me right there's there's a lot of you and one of me but one side feels like they know you and then the and then there's me and I'm just like, you seem cool. I I don't know, like you know what I mean. Um, so I guess I really kind of got off topic here, but I'm trying to do the live streams more. Usually, the slowest months for employment law are August because judges are on vacation and at judge school, and then December because nobody gets fired before Christmas. So I'm hoping. I'm really, 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 really hoping that I can do a live stream every single week, although it is going to bounce around because I actually have to go to New York, um, I think four times in December, but it's super annoying. Like I have to make the trip down to New York like four times, never for more than 36 hours, which is like, listen, I'm not going to complain about it, like, but the clients pay for, you got client needs you, you got to go. That's the gig. And I get to live in this. I, I love where I live. I get to live in this little hobby farm and it makes me super happy. And my clients make that possible. And so I got to do right for my clients. So I got to go to New York, but 
it, it makes me bounce around the uh, the live streams a little bit. I try to post them on the notifications for the channel, like the posts on the channel, as early in the week as I can. Like I think I posted this one Tuesday, I believe, uh, that it was going to be 4 p.m. today. Yeah, Philip, it's exactly like teaching. It's like teaching except for I never meet the people, right? So like a teacher in a classroom meets the students and has like some level of interaction. I don't. Like it, it's... I probably end up talking to there's there's layers of filters between you and me because the volume of people who call trying to talk to me, I could never in a million years talk to that many people. And that sucks because you get in this business to like help people and then you're like, but I can't talk to you. And, but there's like realities of space and time that I, I can't get around, right? Like there's there's a call center who's like, this guy threatened me and says he wants to eat Vince's skin. So we should not call him, right? That happens. Like that, that <laughs> those calls happen, right? So there's the filters do, you know, serve a purpose. Um, and the live streams are kind of like a way around that where um there's like this system where I actually get to interact with you and it's more valuable. So Henry Bez believe. I guess that was the longest way I could possibly answer your question to say, um, I'm trying to do it every week in December. And then in January, I will try to do the same. But I'm going to be up front come February, which is layoff season. Like layoff season is February to May in the US. No chance. I don't even know if you're going to get a single live stream from February to May because we're going to be just going like helping our actual clients. I'm still going to do the daily videos. Uh, I really committed to doing that. And I think I have a pretty good system down for doing the daily videos, but the live streams are a little bit more time consuming and um, just more work. Um, yes. Noriega, it's going great. How you been? How's it going? Um, viral shedding zombie, busy office equals dollar signs. I mean, listen. If you help people, you get paid. Uh, happy Thanksgiving, lemon poppy seed. Okay, we have a question from Jody. Uh, oh. So Jody asks us, I'm a pro se motion for relief and making a motion for default because... making a motion for default because the employer filed an altered document in support of their motion for summary judgment. Is it appropriate to ask the court to calculate damages applying both rules 60B3 and 12B6? Um, you're not going to love my answer. There are definitely re There's definitely recourse for them altering a document. I'm going to believe you wholeheartedly they altered a document. You caught them dead to rights altering a document. I assume you can prove it. That doesn't mean they're in default. And it doesn't mean you're going to win necessarily. It means they took a big hit. They messed up. Their credibility is in tatters right now. You're in a good place. I'm not I'm not trying to knock you down here. You're in a good place. You got them on the ropes. This is great. You're not getting paid because they did something shitty in a in a motion in a motion for summary judgment, right? The the reality is like that's going to blow up. It's a very good chance that's going to blow up their chances of getting summary judgment or motion to dismiss, getting their motion to dismiss um, successfully ruled. But um, it doesn't mean you're necessarily going to win. You still actually have to win the case. Sorry. Mijo Tito asks a question. I am scheduled for an interview with the CCD state agency. I'm not allowed to speak about the CCD and later with the EEOC, which I can speak about for retaliation and disability discrimination against Macy's. What should and shouldn't I do in order to get a successful outcome? I think that you should hire an employment attorney. It, Miho is, is, is the, is the best advice I can possibly give, um, out there. Uh, Jody, thank you for saying the channel is great. I'm sorry I didn't give you the answer you wanted. Um, it sounds like you're doing great work though. I'm really excited about, uh, really excited about that. 
Um, what? Okay, what do we have here? Ah, great question. So Noriega, one of the last ones, great username, asks us, if you heard of other inappropriate things going on in the company that had nothing to do with your case, would it be inappropriate to also report those things to your attorney, even though it doesn't have anything to do with your case? Let me say this. At any point, if an attorney in my firm is like, oh, don't tell me about that. I'd like to hear about that because you're not paying us hourly. And it's our job to reduce risk and add value, right? If there's something going on, something breaking the law, something inappropriate, something that makes people in the company look bad, I want to know about that. We want to know about that because the goal is to reduce risk and add value. And if you can, I don't know, let's let's say, what's, what's going on? Okay, let's say like somebody in the company, some middle manager of the company murders puppies, like on the clock, murders puppies. Is that related to your workplace discrimination case? I would hope not, right? But boy, if that guy gets up to testify, I would like that trial team to be like, hey, sir, how you doing? How you doing? So you're the, you're the guy who murders fucking puppies, right? And that jury would be like, <laughs> right? Well, I don't, it's not that I murder the puppies. I, I, I drown them. Okay, so you just drown puppies. Right. So like the credit, like the credibility could be, there's a lot of things that could be going on where that just, that thing that you share with your attorney could then later be used. Right. And it drives me nuts when attorneys are like, well, this is not my case. This is not related to the case. And it's like, sure, sure. That's true. You're not here to litigate puppy drownings. However, however, you have a fat percentage of this person's take home. And your job, which you get paid handsomely for, both by the client and by the firm you work for, right? Right? Like the, these attorneys, they get a base and then they get a percentage, right? I Listen, I don't know how other firms pay, but I listen, certainly the attorneys that I'm familiar with in this field, they get a nice base salary and they get a percentage of what they win for their clients too. Not from the client, they get it from the firm, what the firm gets, right? So like if I hear an associate saying, I don't, don't bother me with that puppy drowning noise. How about I drown you? <laughs> like, obviously I'm being facetious, but like, why do you hate yourself, associate? One, one, that could have really reduced risk in the case by hitting the credibility of one of their key witnesses. Two, uh, that's like an indirect way to increase the valuation of a case, right? Like, if you can get the jury riled up, you can get bigger numbers. The judge and the jury instructions, all they want can be like, ah, oh, listen, you can't factor in the puppy drownings. That's not part of this case. And, you know, that's good because you don't want the jurors to put that in the verdict. But in the back of their minds, in the back of their minds, they could be like, these motherfuckers drown puppies. I would like to harm these people. And, I, and so I will do the only thing to them that I can, which is give a bigger verdict to this plaintiff, which has a case against them, right? So... Always, always had that conversation with your attorney. You don't pay us by the hour. Let us earn our living. Let us, let us earn our, our fee. Right? That was quite a rant. I'm sorry. Um. Oh, okay. Eagle ninety seven asks, Are you familiar with the term remote work discrimination? Could, oh, whoa, we just jumped. All right, chat just jumped. Uh, are you familiar with the term remote work discrimination? Could someone who is working remotely as an accommodation have a claim for failure to promote? The employer claims only employees who, jumping ahead, jumping ahead, let's find it. Uh, Eagle, I don't think you finished your question. Leaving me hanging. Leaving me hanging. Oh, here we go. It came up now. Um, could someone who is working remotely as an accommodation have a claim for failure to promote if the employer claims only employees who work in the office can be promoted to a supervisory level? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So Eagle, Eagle, there's two things there, right? If, if the statement is, um, you can't be promoted to supervisor because you work remotely, I would argue that is going to be probably 
depending on, on, on the path to uh, to that accommodation, right? If it's if it's your disability that has you working remotely, then yes, that's probably disability discrimination. But there's a counterpoint to that. If the employer says, hey, uh, you're totally up for promotion, but we have to let you know, supervisors do have to come in. That's a big part of being a supervisor. You have to come in. Um, that may be legit, right? Like if you're supervising a call center, you might need to be there, right? Uh, supervising might require you actually be present. Now, I don't know that's the case. And I'm certainly not arguing supervising always requires you to be present. Certainly, we have supervisors in our firm that work remotely, but different jobs are different, right? Like if you have a bunch of, I don't know, uh, yeah, call center employees, and you need to be with them coaching them and make sure they're coming in and making sure they're not like playing on their phone in their bathroom for half an hour and all this stuff, right? Like if, if it's like that kind of gig, you might actually have to be there. I don't know. Um, so those are two different things, right? If you're not eligible for promotion because you work remotely, probably discrimination. If you're totally eligible, but you would have to decide that you want to work in office, well, that's a reasonability question, right? Is this accommodation reasonable as a supervisor? They were reasonable about you having the accommodation at this lower position, but now if you bump up to supervisor, they say you can't. They say the reasonability standard has changed and that accommodation is longer reasonable. Got to have that reasonable accommodation dialogue again. Is it reasonable? Could you work remotely? Like it, it, it's There's a lot more tension to that question. Um, yeah. Um, SEK. Why are you deleting your questions? I want to answer your questions. Is that the famous? I believe S. Oh, I believe SEK might be a famous YouTuber. I could be wrong. Um, let me go in order here. Let me not start skipping. Susie asks us, uh, I filed with the EOC and now my employer is micromanaging me. Is this retaliation? It absolutely could be. If you can prove that you're being micromanaged uh, or that you're, you know, your, your file's being papered or anything like that because you filed, that's retaliation. Also, there's a presumption. There's a presumption that it's retaliation, right? So remember that burden shifting. Oh, FF, uh, Vince, any advice for young plaintiff side attorney trying to build their own firm? I want to provide the best representation possible. Yeah, I would actually, so I have a video coming out tomorrow, which I'm sure is no use to you. It's about um, a young attorney asking me about buying suits and like what kind of suits to buy. So I just kind of cranked out a video I think it goes live tomorrow about like how I used to buy suits when I was super poor, like super poor. Like I was working as a young attorney, basing like 32K. I had my percentage, but the firm didn't always pay it. And I was like still working in bars at night. Like I would like work till like 4 a.m. At, at a bar, like bouncing um, just to make ends meet. Um, that's, that's how poor I was. And that, and I, you got to buy the suits. You got to do the stuff. Like you got to like progress your career. Uh, that's coming out tomorrow. I'm sure you don't need that. You look from your profile picture, you look very well groomed and dressed, coiffed. Um, the biggest thing I would do, and I, I'm not a proponent of Gary Vaynerchuk because he's gotten kind of scammy with like the the Bitcoin and the, the little picture things and everything he sells. Um, but he has a gift economy book that I believe in wholeheartedly. We're like, if you give people things, um, if you help people, like, and sincerely want to help them, that's going to like build you. It's going to build your skill set. It's going to build your brand. It's going to build everything about your practice, right? Um, like early on, like proof, of, provide proof of concept. Sometimes you got to do a trial. Like I want to do trial work. Nobody's going to hire you for trial work, right? You're like, I want some firm to hire me to do trials. Cool. How many have you done? None. Great. Not a chance. Right. So you might have to be like, listen, I will do this trial for, I, I knew I had a buddy. I think he did a trial for 10%. He's like, listen, uh, somehow you pro se litigant got your case to trial. I will try this case for you. I've never done it before. Uh, we can go together, do it hand in hand. Give me 10% of what I win for you. And a trial is a nightmare. That's, that's not a great fee structure, but like it got, it got him a trial. And then he did another and another and another. And now he's a he's a legitimate trial guy, right? So um, I recommend that. 
certainly. Um, What else can I tell you? Well, like, I would love to have you on the channel. Uh, also, like, it depends on where you are. So, like, all the national firms, FF, have local counsel in a variety of areas, right? So we're flying attorneys around the country. But if we have uh, a case in, like, Arizona, we have a local counsel, right? And and you need to involve that person. So you get to learn a lot of cases, local counsel. That might be a good arrangement for you. Get some money in your pocket as you start up your practice. But also um, get to have like ties to a national firm. Maybe they give you cases. Maybe like most of the national firms have more good cases than they can take. It's the bizarre thing about this industry, right? So tying yourself to one of the national firms might get you a caseload. It's a reality. That's something to think about, you know. Um, and you know, have those discussions. So I hope, I hope this helps. But yeah, I'd be happy to have you on the channel if you want to talk about your practice at any point. Uh, what do we have? Alfalfa asks, I'm wondering if it matters if a harmed employee was fired, constructively terminated, or quit in an employment, sexual harassment, and discrimination case. If so, how and why? Um, I'm just going to give you a quick rundown there. If you have complained about sexual harassment or discrimination, and then you are terminated, that is a real, so that, that is probably the most valuable scenario. If you quit, um, but you can argue, excuse me, but you can argue that it's constructive termination, it doesn't invalidate the case in any way. It's just not the most valuable scenario, right? Because they're going to say, well, we didn't fire the person, right? If you're terminated outright, I have a very exciting argument for retaliation, Right. It's a more complex argument. If I'm like, well, they, they treated this person really badly and this person had to leave. Constructively, they were forced out. It's like she or he was terminated, right? And they're going to be like, their response is going to be like, but no, we didn't fire the person. And that's not as clear cut. It's not as simple. Simple narratives sell. Complex narratives have to be sold, right? Um, like sometimes you can, you can just look at a guy and you can be like, Oh yeah, that guy did this. Yeah, I really believe this guy did. It, right, that's a really simple narrative, you know. Whereas if you look like a guy's like a monk and he just like comes in with a little halo over his head, and he's the head of of the the homeless committee for five counties and he saved thirty lives, can you still get him for sexual harassment? Sure, gonna have to sell that narrative a little more, right? Then Jimmy who owns five uh, strip clubs and uh, face trial for rape, attempted rape once, right? Like those are two very different people. One's a very simple narrative. And one's going to take some selling. And here too, being terminated versus constructive termination, these, you know, one's very simple narrative, sells itself. The other must be sold. It's more work. It's more risk. It's a little, that's not bad. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying they're not truly equal. Um... Miho, I'm sorry. We don't take questions in emails. Um, but but I, I hope that I answered your question. And I'm here if you have more questions. Um, we can't. We, uh, Miho, uh, I apologize. I don't mean to be rude. Um, it's just that, like, we can't. The, the volume of emails we get is, like, not physically possible to answer everybody's questions. Um, I take a crack when I have time, but, like, the clients have to come first and then, like, I need to not die. Like I need to meet my own needs and like not, um, not have blood pressure of like a hundred and 120, like two, 204 over 120 or whatever it was. Uh, so I need to like take care of my health and everything. Like we just don't have enough time, uh, to answer every single question. I apologize for that, but please here, I'm here to answer your questions. Um, what do we have? Oh, Okay. SEK4110 asks us, what evidence would it take to show a reverse discrimination case for failure to promote? P.S. I know there's really no such thing as reverse discrimination, only discrimination based on race. Yes, you're absolutely right. There is no such thing as reverse discrimination. If you're not hiring someone because they're Caucasian, that is just discrimination. You're absolutely correct. Um, it's the same. It's the same evidence for any other race or protected class. You need something to show that it's more likely than not 
that a jury would believe like you need something it's more like than not that the person's race their cock their caucasity their caucasian uh nature right their skin their race is the reason why a bad thing was done to them right if you can make a juror believe that that was the cause then you have a discrimination claim even though that person's caucasian it's no different right uh, okay got it um okay miho tito asks us one for, so miho tito is i think looking for representation Says one firm said they will not be able to represent me because they are overloaded with cases. Another said that my case will need a special counsel. None of none said your claim sucks. LOL. A third one also offered other firms. Do you think they're they're linking out because it is Macy's or maybe they shop at Macy's? No, no. I, Macy's is like a kind of a turnstile for settlements in my experience. Although I will. Um, say that once, well, I don't actually know if I can say this. Maybe I can say this. An outside counsel, so like a, a defense firm from ACES once said to me, um, we believe your client is going to die before trial. The client was very sick. So we're not going to settle with you because what are you going to do a trial without a witness? Um, yeah, we did get fucked. <laughs> yeah, that's a horrible thing to say. My client did pass away. Um, but that was not an intelligent play on Macy's part, in my opinion. Um, Noriega asks, what is the purpose of a national law firm having local counsel in the state where the national firm took the case? What does the local counsel do for the national law firm that took the case? I'm trying to understand. Okay. Noriega. So some states have rules. So we we can practice in the EEOC in all 50 states, right? Any of the national firms can do that. But a lot of states are going to say, um, hey, you need an office in our state to practice law in our state. And there's something that you know, they can try to they can try to make that argument. So the local council will be like, well, I've got an office here. Give me a little piece of the case. And I'll make the pro hoc motion and bring your attorneys in and your trial team. So your trial team doesn't need to be specifically admitted to this state. We can make the pro hoc motion as local counsel. I can sponsor them in and get them in to do the trial in federal court. Uh, even though like if it's uh, Georgia, this is the cases in Georgia. And I'm like looking at this case. And I'm like, oh my God, I got the ideal trial team for this case. But neither of them are admitted in Georgia. Well, that's annoying, except, except local council, come on down, make my pro hoc motion, get my, get my team in there. Right. That's, that's part of what they do. And also they do some running, right? Like, um, Hey, uh, some, some courthouses are not as technologically savvy as others. Sometimes you need something signed locally. There's a lot of stuff that goes on, right? Like, Hey, uh, you, we got an appearance. We, all you have to do is show up the judge. I'm here. And there's no argument. There's no nothing. I'm not going to fly an attorney down for a new argument appearance, right? Local counsel. Thank you for saving my attorney, uh, uh, you know, a 20 hour round trip travel experience, right? So it's local counsel. There's a lot of the um, procedural stuff, you know, generally speaking. Uh, Lemon Poppy Seed asked us, are there other employees from Amazon here? I would expect there are. Uh, I always wonder how many people in the chat are fighting these mega corporations. Many of them. Uh, Philip asks, why is February to May layoff season? I think, Philip, there's a economic reason, like uh, probably a tax reason for that. I'm not, I'm not really savvy. I just know that layoffs tend to happen in my experience between February and May. <sighs> Sir Dodge asks us, why do you think most people wait until they get fired before filing an EEOC complaint? Because I, I think that people can't imagine being at war with their employer while they still have to go to work every day. Um, you absolutely can file while you're still employed. And I would argue filing while you're still employed is the most effective path in my experience. 
um, I always recommend like, listen, it's hard to file in the EOC and have like a law firm fighting for you and all this acrimony and, and hate going on and, and, and you're just going in every day. That's tense, but also boy, what a liability for your employer because any idiot on their payroll who did something nasty to you during that process, just hand you that retaliation claim on a little silver platter, right? And that's really valuable. So sometimes they'll pay a premium to be like, hey, uh, we got to get this done. We This massive liability on our books because any idiot could do something nasty to you. Uh, can, can we go to mediation? Like that's that's a really nice uh, leverage position to kind of, you know, bend, bend, bend things a little bit in your favor. Um. Let's see, Jupiter. Thank you so much, Matthew. I do not discuss. Excuse me. I do not discuss case law on the channel. Generally speaking, I don't think it's the most useful thing for people on this channel. Um, we use Westlaw, and I don't like it. <laughs> I don't like Westlaw at all. Um, recently, I had a spat with Westlaw where Westlaw was like, "You ran up a twenty thousand dollar bill on your research credentials." And I said to them, I've never logged in to my Westlaw account. I don't like my Westlaw account. I have my own research account that's separate from the firms. We have Westlaw because the, the firm's attorneys like it. Um, and they were like, oh, wait, what? You've never logged in? I was like, yeah, never once. So you're you're trying to bill me on credentials that have never been used for $20,000 of research that you're saying I did. And uh, Westlaw is like, Oh, so I don't love Thompson writers. I don't love Westlaw. Not a fan. I don't think it's the best. I don't think it's the best software. I can think at least of two that I prefer over Westlaw. Um, Alfalfa, I am a lover. So Alfalfa asks, um, curious if, if you have a favorite holiday dish, Vince. I am a great lover of roast duck and of prime rib. Love me some prime rib. I cook a lot of prime rib. It's something I, I do a lot of repetitions of to practice, and I love it. Uh, Bethel asks, if a person was never provided reasonable accommodations, and that was reviewed and approved by a supervisor and a RA manager within the federal agency, what do you recommend? I, you, it sounds like you have to go through the federal employee disability discrimination process. Um. I mean, that, that sounds like disability discrimination. As long as your accommodations were reasonable in nature, I would think that you would have a claim there. Um, let me read that question again. Can an employer force an employee who is represented as part of a demand letter but is doing their EOC or state agency filing and fact-finding conference. Uh, Eagle, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't fully understand that question. FF, totally. If I can help you get launched, that would, uh, whatever I can do to get more young attorneys into this field would make me happy. There are not enough attorneys in this field. I would like to be obsolete. I would like to retire. Uh, Matthew technically, oh, so Matthew asks, what sanctions can a court give to a pro se litigant? Um, Matthew, I don't want to talk off the cuff. I, I've not looked into, you know, not being a pro se litigant, I've not looked into what possible consequences are there for a pro se litigant. I would expect um, that all of the sanctions, the full breadth and width of sanctions, except those sanctions for which you have to be an attorney, right? Like, uh, something, something to my license or something like that, something to an attorney's license. Like you, obviously your license can't be imperiled because you don't have a law license. So I would think that all the other sanctions are on the table, except the ones that require you to have a law license. But, um, I don't know. I have not looked into that. Sir Dodge says I have filed at the EEOC while I'm still employed. And it's tough. I believe that. I believe it's tough. Yeah. And that's one of the things I always tell people like, listen, if you can, you can stay at the job, the case is worth more, but you have to put your well being first. It, it's a tough thing. It's a tough, tough thing. Uh, alfalfa, um, there's not so much a media. Oh, alfalfa asks, is there such a thing as mediation season? And the response that I have for that is not necessarily. Um, there's a lot of spring mediations, 
but even more so the the settlement season is before the end of fiscal year, right? So like um, November and a little bit of December is just companies like trying to trying to get checks like out the door. Like, oh boy, we definitely uh, want to get this off the books this year. Big liability, big case. Um, what's it going to take to get it done? So like settlement season is like early November into maybe early December, I guess, but even more early November. Like people are just trying to like get, make it rain on plaintiffs pretty much. Like it, it's shocking how many cases move. And also the other side of that is all of a sudden plaintiffs need money because the holidays are coming up. So there's a lot of people who'd be like, there's no chance that I'll take a hundred grand on this case. But I would like to be in the French Alps for Christmas. So, uh, Vince, can you get me like 160? What do we like, you, like? That happens a lot, right? Like, it, there's a lot of that, which I get. Which you know, listen, I get it. We all have our reasons for settling a case, and also some people just don't want to like, go into the new year with that kind of grief. And this is true for employers and employees, for plaintiffs and and, and defendants. Some people are just like, I don't want to deal with this over Christmas. Like, this is making me sick. This is giving me ulcers. This is upsetting me. Ugh, let's get it done. Right. You see a lot of that in settlement season. All right. We have like a, a five part question here. So let me read it. I'm going to pause on air to read the five part question. And I'm going to see if I can read it out loud. Okay. This is a great question. So Ross John asked us, and I'll read the question. My former employer made false claims that he had an uneasy feeling that I was potentially a risk to harm myself or others after I was terminated and sent, I think sent me home as a precaution and asked them to work from home as a further precaution. So I don't know if he sent others home or sent you home, Ross. Um, I've had job opportunities in my professional network taken away my former coworkers are now intimidated from testifying against my employer. I find it difficult to talk openly about this because of the ongoing EOC investigation, disability discrimination. Um, how can I address these claims so that I can repair my reputation and find a new job without breaching non-disparagement clause? So, uh, Ross, if you have a litigation going, um, and obviously check with local counsel, talk to your attorney, but there's a good chance that that non-disparagement clause is not going to be effective in that litigation. So I would urge you to potentially write this nonsense, you know, write this wrong in the litigation and create documentation of how nonsensical that is. Um, and if you do reach a settlement, you might need in that settlement a statement from him from this, this person who said these things, that he was wrong, that he made that up, whatever it is, whatever you feel you need to, to write your reputation. Also, um, so I see you have disability discrimination claims there. Sounds like you also have been handed a perceived disability claim, which the employer uh, spoke into being for you by saying he had an uneasy feeling that you were potentially a risk to harm yourself or others, right? That is essentially, if that's something he wrote, that's something he put in writing in a sworn statement or, or whatever it is, uh, that sounds a lot like a sworn statement that says he engaged in perceived disability discrimination, right? So like, don't sleep on that claim. I don't know if that's what your disability claim is about. It might be, it might not be, but like, there's also that perceived disability claim, which it certainly sounds like he handed to you and low key pled guilty to indirectly, right? So think about that. Uh, SEK 4110. Are there any potential issues if a person claims more than one protected class in a discrimination complaint, such as age, gender, and race? No, I don't think so. So like I've heard attorneys argue that, um, it dilutes claims and I don't really agree. I can give you, listen, if you have, if you have 10 protected classes, feel like we may have diluted our claims. Like there, there, there might be a situation going on. Obviously it's always specific, specifically driven by the circumstances of your case. But like I suspect if you have 10 
protected classes in play, uh, you know, um, your attorney's probably not editing you properly and, and things have been diluted, right? There's a lot of clients who come in very forceful and they're like, listen, I want all 10 of these claims in there. No matter, I want 10 protected classes. And, and I, as the attorney, have to be like, yeah. So I see three of these as pretty legitimate. They're, they're valuable claims. Like we should go forward on these three. If you bring these other seven, you're engaging in self-harm. And that client might tell me to jump off a uh, bridge, right? I, I want all 10 in there. I'm going to hire somebody who will do it for me. Cool. Go ahead. Like you just have to be kind of tough on Because people will bring claims like um, that don't make sense a lot. People will hear claims and think that like, think that that helps them or like that that fits their circumstances. And you're like, I don't, I don't think you don't know the elements of that claim. This does not fit what happened to you. There are claims that do fit what happened to you. And here they are. We've, we've given them to you. We think you should go forward with these, but people will just be like, I want the other seven protected classes. Okay. That's probably not going to be a great idea, but I'll give you an example. Um, African-American woman. That's two protected classes. They go together. African-American women are treated very poorly. They're treated like the angry black woman. Oh my God. She budged in front of me in coffee and I can't say anything because she's, she's an African-American woman. And if I say something, ah, she's, she's going to go crazy. Fucking racist. That's some racist bullshit tied to her gender too, right? Like that's, people do that all the time to black women. Like, how shitty must it be to go through your life as an adult black woman getting like sullen dagger eyes, but people don't want to like say things to you. Like if I, if I accidentally walk in front of somebody in line at Starbucks, they're like, Hey, asshole. Like gives me an opportunity to be like, Oh, my bad. I'm sorry. You're right. <laughs> Let me go do the right thing. Right. But shit happens inadvertently. Right. And if you're treating somebody like the angry black woman, there's no chance to write it. Now let's pretend further that's your coworker that you budged in front of back on accident. Right. You have an enemy for life. And you don't even know about it. You didn't have a chance to right the wrong because of your gender and your race. Huh. Right. So like, listen, if you're going to tell me protected classes don't go together sometimes. No. Nah. <laughs> no. No. I don't. I don't agree with that. Certainly protected classes can be brought together. And often that is the case. That's true. That's true. That's, listen, I can even think of old white men, mm. right? I can think of situations where people are like, ah, he's not going to get it. He's an old white man. Don't promote him. <laughs> that is technically discrimination, right? Like, uh, you're making some assumptions based about gender and race. It's not always gender and race. There's lots of things that go on. There's a lot of protected classes that tend to go like in unity. I'll tell you what, lots of people with age claims also have disability claims. Why? Older people tend to have more disabilities. Also, people tend to view older people as infirm. Goes together, age and disability, right? So certainly I think that is the case. Um, oh, Snoops, great question. Snoops asked, can your lawyer settle a case for you without your permission that includes leaving your position if you never wanted to leave your position? I'll go a step further. And Snoops, this is true in New York, and I can't say that it's true in every jurisdiction. But um, if an attorney in New York settles your case without your authority, I view that as an ethical violation. And that's true whether... So like... And, and, I, and I, people, I don't even do it on verbal authority, right? So like we have associates who will be like, oh yeah, this client and I are super cool. I've been helping this client for like nine months. We're tight. We, we are friendly. And she said, I can go settle this case for 90 grand. Cool. Do you hate yourself? Get it in writing. No, 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 no. We're cool. I can trust her. No, I'm not saying you can't trust her. I'm saying get it in writing. Like, what are you, like, what are you talking about? Also, because shit happens. Cases settle and the client's like, oh, my family made fun of me. They said I took too little. They say I'm dumb. I, I got to get out of the settlement. Um, I'm going to tell people you lied and then I never told you you could settle the case. And you're like, what? Like, that's like, I could get in a lot of trouble for that. And the client's like, I'm sorry. My family's making fun of me. I, I don't care about you. 
get it in writing. So like, I would say to you, Snoop, that no one should, Snoops, no one should ever, no attorney should ever settle the case for you without your written authority. Now you can get it in advance. You can tell the attorney, listen, give me as much as you can, but if you give me over a hundred K, I'll take it. Okay. Put it in writing. We can operate on your authority. But if the other side comes back with 99K, tell you what I'm not doing, taking it without your written authority. I'm going to call you and say, hey, uh, you said take 100K. I didn't get you 100K. I got you 99 today. I think if you give me more time, I might still give you more, but you need to know they're currently offering 99. Um, do you want me to take it? Right? You might say, Vince, don't call me. I don't want to hear about anything under 100K. Great. If that's in writing, I won't. You're the boss, right? Um, the idea that someone would settle your case and end your employment without your say so is wild to me. And I, I do think it's an ethical breach. Ooh, Noriega. I'm excited about your prime rib. Can we get pictures for the channel? I would like, we, we can have a prime rib competition. I will, I too will be doing prime rib for Christmas. I think we should have doing prime rib. I will post a video of my prime rib. Um, Eagle 97, I listen, go, attorneys ghostwriting stuff is like dicey and varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. I, I wouldn't feel comfortable answering this question. Uh, <clears throat> hey, Giovanni, what's going on with you? What's going on? I hope everything's good. Um, Snoops asks, can a lawyer quit a case when two other cases of yours settled, the last one is still in process? So Snoops, it depends. If there was a global settlement in either one of those other cases, then all the cases would be resolved, right? So like, generally speaking, an employer will say, uh, hey, uh, we're not going to settle this one case. We want a global settlement. Now, listen, not always. Certainly, I've had situations where a case will individually be settled, but there's like other claims. Like we've had we've had massive shareholder litigation. People like litigating over like board spots on a multinational corporation. And also we have a discrimination case. And like those board spots are worth like $11 billion. But this discrimination case is worth like, I don't know, 15 mil. And clearly... You're not going to do a global settlement for that discrimination case. That's going to resolve the $11 billion question of the board seats, right? Uh, that's going to take a little bit longer, but they might want to square away that discrimination case. So you might do like a singular settlement for that one claim and get rid of it. And then be like, all right, let's deal with the board seats now. At least we can get rid of some of the attorneys, right? That happens. But most often, if you have multiple claims open, the employer is going to say, I need a global settlement. I need to resolve everything. I can't be litigating with this person for the rest of my life. Any settlement we're talking about, it's got to get everything done. I don't want to fight with this person anymore. I want to be done, right? That's more common. So listen, if there's a global settlement, then it makes sense that your attorney be like, what are you talking about? There's no more claims. We settle everything. If there's one that still survives, that's different. And it depends on the retainer they have with you, whatever you've agreed to with this attorney. <sighs> Alfalfa asks, Vince, I've been trying to research and understand the claims my attorney filed. There are like five or six retaliation claims. What does that mean? Are there different types of retaliation in employment law? Yes, there are definitely different kinds of retaliation. So um, I'm going to do a real quick rundown. There's federal retaliation claims, state retaliation claims, local retaliation claims. Then on top of that, you're going to have like uh, retaliation claims flowing from sexual harassment, retaliation claims flowing from disability discrimination, retaliation claims flowing from unpaid wages and complaints of unpaid wages, retaliation claims file, uh, flowing from like union activity, retaliation claims flowing from uh, different kinds of whistleblowing, whistleblowing about public safety, whistleblowing about um, federal funds being misappropriated, whistleblowing tied to a variety of other things on a state level, depending on the state, like wh whistleblowing, whistleblowing, whistleblowing claims tied to... Uh, being a Chinese spy are now a thing that we see, right? So yeah, there's there's a million and one different kinds of retaliation and it's going to be different from jurisdiction to jurisdiction as well. Let me take a sip of coffee here. All right, Giovanni, let's, uh, let's get in on this. So Giovanni X says, I reported discriminatory comments verbally to my HR department. They didn't document anything. 
and they said they'd have to begin an investigation on my behalf. It's been 14 days. They've yet to respond. Okay. HR exists to protect your employer. They will only help you when helping you is the best way to protect your employer. So let's look at what we've got right now. We have a verbal complaint, no written record of it. Great. That is the easiest complaint to get rid of. You should make your complaint in writing, retain a copy. Ideally, make your complaint using an email that you have control of, like not your work email. So like if you can email HR from like an email, like a Gmail account, right? Have that timestamp by a third party who presumably you don't work for Google, I hope, doesn't care about the case and won't possibly do something to your email, right? Um, and then also, listen, they're sitting around not investigating, right? You might need to go outside. You might need to file the EOC. You might need to talk to attorneys. It's going to depend on how serious things are. It's going to depend on what result you want, right? But internal investigations are essentially hush jobs 99% of the time. Like there's going to be a lot of like, well, what are you looking for? You want an apology? If I get an apology and we just make this all go away, you want the apology? I mean, you still got to work with the person, but like I get you the apology. Thanks for nothing, asshole. Right? Like that's not what we're doing here. We got a bad person doing bad things. I'd like that to stop. And then I'd like to not be out here working without a net with this person who hates me because I reported them. Right? The, the internal HR process to me is, is kind of a fiction. Of course, I say that. I'm an employment attorney. Um but, you know, it's just my thoughts, Giovanni. Alfalfa, yes, we should all do prime rib videos for Christmas. I think I'm actually going to be doing mine on Christmas Eve. Um, yeah, prime rib cook-off. I, I, will, I will start, like, some kind of uh, email chain so we can – we can do a legitimate prime rib cook-off and then do like a, a rotation video where we show everybody's prime rib for the holiday. That'd be really cool. That'd be a nice community thing for the channel. Look at that. You, Noriega and Alfalfa. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from New York City Law or Not. Hi, Vince. Thanks for doing these uh, live on top of recordings. It, my pleasure. The lives are a little more demanding. I'm not going to lie to you. Um in terms of time, if nothing else. But I also feel like I have to really be on. Like if I make a, a dumb video, and I'm pretty lazy, so I don't really do this. But if I make a if I make a video where I sound dumb, I can just delete it. Right? I can just be like, oh yeah, don't post that. Or sometimes I'll make a video and the other people who work on the channel will be like, hey, sound like an asshole. Don't post that. I'm like, well, <laughs> guess I shouldn't post that, right? On the live, there's no net. I have to just be me and hope that's good enough. Hope I hope I have the knowledge. Hope I have the attitude. Hope I I, I can supply people what they need. Uh, so it is a little. I, I do have to be a little bit more on top on the lives. Um, but New York City Law or not has a question. My question is: If a discrimination case exists and an FMLA case also exists and they are intermingled, can you file both cases if the EOC takes so long statute of limitations? Oh, can you buy out both cases if the EEOC takes so long that the statute of limitations and the FMLA claim is coming up? So here's what you do. You absolutely can. Um, you need to calendar the FMLA statute of limitations the day it runs out. And if it runs out before you get your right to sue letter from the EEOC, you need to file that FMLA case. And you're then going to have, depending on the check your local jurisdiction, but often you're going to have 120 days as a right to amend. Check where you are. Check with local counsel. Do not base this on what I'm saying. But often you're going to have 120 days as a right, meaning you don't even have to ask permission. Now, that's that's a good first step to make sure that you're not going to lose the FMLA claim. The FMLA claim can be valuable. Don't let it die in the vine. But meanwhile, you're going to file this litigation anyways. So just go to the EOC and be like, listen, assholes, you're, we all know you're not doing anything. Give me the right to sue letter. Say it nicely. Be like, oh, you helped me so much. Thank you for all you've done for plaintiffs. Could I have my right to sue letter so that you could do less work? I know you have so many people to help, right? And the EOC will be like, we like less work. Sure. I'll just give you the right to sue letter, right? Um, it's not always that simple. Sometimes they'll like give you the business a little bit, but especially if you have counsel, they're just going to give you the right to sue letter. Uh, generally, any, any attorney in this field is generally going to be able to get a right to sue letter. 
Um, I feel like the right to sue letter is the only thing I can guarantee my clients. Like you can't guarantee a win in this field. You can't do it. You're a bad person. You're a liar. You're a lying liar and a bad person if you guarantee a win. Which is what it is. There's no sure things in employment law, except I feel confident I can guarantee a right to sue letter. <laughs> I have never in my career failed to obtain a right to sue letter. Um, so get that right to sue letter from the EOC, get it ASAP, and hopefully you can just file everything together because you'd rather file everything together than have to amend. That's a hassle. That's extra work for your attorneys. They're not going to love that. But like, listen, you got to print that FMLA claim. That's what they have to do. That's what they have to do. But you know, if you can do it together, better. <sighs> what do we have? Um, uh, YouTube user John Doe asks us, Oh, okay. Uh, John Doe says, hey, Vince, why do you only take employment discrimination cases and not also education and housing discrimination? The various laws are interrelated, and there's a dearth of lawyers in those areas. John Doe, get ready to like me less. Um, those cases are not worth as much. There's an economic reality of this industry. Um If I like represent somebody who didn't get an apartment in New York City because of a protected class, what's that worth? They probably didn't become homeless, generally speaking. Could could they have become homeless? Maybe. Also, though, uh, the New York City court system hates homeless people. So that case might also not be that valuable. But um, like if you don't get an apartment, we're kind of talking emotional damages, realistically speaking. Like what's whereas with like housing discrimination or, or with employment discrimination. I had a job. I was making hundred K a year and somebody said something about my protected class and I got fired when I complained about it. So uh, I would have worked there. It's going to take me three years to find comparable work. So economic damage of 300 K plus I have emotional damages that are going to be equal or greater to the emotional damages tied to not getting an apartment. Right. Cause I mean, you can get another apartment, but like that job is how you fed your family. It's how you keep a roof over your head. It's how you survive. It's how you keep the people you love alive, right? So that employment case, even without the retaliation claim, which gives rise to those punitive damages, which we love, right? That's worth so much more. And if somebody's like, oh, uh, Vince, why don't you, why don't you take housing discrimination cases or education discrimination cases? I do occasionally take education discrimination cases, but they're generally um, things I feel strongly about or or um, I, things I feel strongly about in the education world or um, the client feels very strongly and has a fat bank account and would like to pay hourly, right? There's definitely, listen, that happens. I'm not going to lie. There's people coming in like, I was at this prestigious university getting my prestigious degree. And then a bad thing happened to me, and I think it was discrimination. And it looks very much like we can prove that. And I would like to bring a case. And my response is, I would love to bring a case, but that bringing a case to you is going to cost me like 40, 80 grand. You know, I, I'm not really, I don't think I can win you enough because you're going to get the same degree from this other prestigious university because you're, you're swell. You're doing great. Like you just, you transferred because things were bad. And they'd be like, yeah, I don't care about that. Enough with the talkie talkie events. Just give me the retainer. I would like to just start cutting a check. Like, okay, you, you're going to, I'm going to assign you an associate. It's not going to be me, but like, okay, if that's what you want, we can do that. You know? Um, yeah, the cases just aren't worth enough. I can't spend on a housing discrimination case. Like if I took a housing discrimination case and I spent 40 to 80 grand on it, like I do on an employment case, like that goes to trial. I'll tell you right now, even if I win, I'm not breaking even. Not a chance. <sighs> Thank you, Giovanni. That's very nice of you. I think, listen, there was a young employment plaintiff attorney earlier in this live stream who, who might who might start doing videos. I don't know. Like he he sounds like he's gonna he he was talking about joining us on the channel for for you know a quick video getting his practice set up. I was like, well, we do need more young plaintiffs, you know, attorneys in this field. So maybe he will be, he or she will be doing it like me. Who knows? 
Uh, Giovanni also says, I followed, I followed the EOC. I guess my next move is to go back in and get some paperwork done. Won't the EEOC their lack of effort as bad? There's a witness as well. Yeah, EOC definitely could see their, their lack of effort as bad. EOC is very lazy, so don't you know? Don't count on too much. Noriega says, "Is having an attorney before your initial EEOC interview a great benefit? And what is the role of the attorney during the initial EEOC interview if there is a role for them?" Excuse me. So Noriega, I think it's a huge benefit. And I think one of the main things, first off, that interview is not going to go down at all. If you have counsel, it's very likely you're not going to have to go to the interview and they're going to accept sworn statements from you through your attorney. So you get to workshop your statements and your narrative with your counsel more often than not and not have to speak off the cuff at all, which is an incredible value. Like the UC investigator is not trying to trip you up, but they're also not trying to help you. And getting to workshop and go forward with the most compelling version of your narrative from day one is an incredible quality of life benefit. It's also, it reduces risk and adds value, right? Let, and, and plus the attorney gets the same theoretical percentage, whether you have them on day one or the last day of trial. I mean, listen, you might, you might be able to cut a special deal with your attorney. I don't know, but most attorneys I know aren't excited to come in the last day, right? There's 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 some weird attorneys in the country who are like, oh, I don't want to be involved at the EOC stage. And I don't agree with them. I'm not saying they're bad attorneys. I don't agree with them. My take is, you're going to pay us a percentage and we're going to live our, our nice, comfy lives, our well-funded existences off of winning a percentage of your case. Let us start earning our money on day one, is my opinion. And also, from my perspective, I'm a lot more comfortable with that case because I've known you for longer. You're not an unknown quantity, right? Like when people come in and this happens, people are like, listen, I've been pro se for three years and I have trial now and I'm not going to do this trial. So I want you to take over. I, I know you're not doing this, but I'm just saying hypothetically. My take is like, well, that's a wild thing for me to consider because I don't know what you've done. It's going to take me tens of hours. I'm going to have to sign attorneys to review everything you've done because there's an entire EEOC record, maybe state agency record, federal litigation or state court litigation, maybe an arbitration that's gone on. So much for my attorneys to look at. There's so many opportunities for a pro se litigant to do damage to the claim, to introduce risk, to introduce cracks in the narrative, to, to have different versions of the narrative, right? And those I'm not saying the person's lying. I'm saying the way they presented the narrative sounds disjointed, right? It's it's very easy to tell the same story three times and have it have it appear to a listener like it's 15 degrees off each time. Uh, things change a little bit. Things change a little bit. But if you have someone whose entire job is to work with that narrative and keep it always accurate, but keep it in the most compelling honest, clear-cut, low-risk, high-value version of that narrative, well, that's that's a benefit, in my opinion, Noriega. Uh, Anish asks, is how long does the company's attorney have to respond to new discovery? What's the time frame? Anish, depending on where you're litigating, often there's going to be a discovery schedule. And that discovery schedule will set out both when discovery demands have to go out and when responses have to be in by. Um, that's not always the case, and I don't know where you're litigating, so I don't, you know, I don't fully know the answer or how long you're going to have. But that's generally the case. So you know, speak with your attorney. Your attorney probably knows. If you're representing yourself, um, check for any kind of scheduling order or discovery deadlines order or anything like that. Okay, this is a fun question. So Alfalfa asks, uh, Vince, cases are expensive and plaintiff's attorneys work on a percentage of the case after it is settled. How much do you have to have saved up in order to open your own employment firm and actually represent clients? So 
I'm going to tell you a story about an asshole. And then I'm going to tell you what would probably be the right way to do this. So when I started out, um, my firm way back for I, 12 years ago, I, whatever I listen, I sold that firm. But when I, when I first went out on my own, I had one, like I'd work for another firm, but obviously they keep the money. Right. And I went out, um, and, and one person hired me and I, I took the case and I pretty much still working in bars. I was doing bankruptcy work cause I was admitted in federal court and I could get like two grand a pop for retail bankruptcies. So I was funding the firm with retail bankruptcy and I knew like one retail bankruptcy a month paid my living rent because it's New York and a second retail bankruptcy per month paid my office rent and, and my like research and my malpractice insurance. And then I could spend the rest of the month working on this employment case. And I really could only fund that one employment case. And I was working with another guy, he's a fantastic guy. And um, hell, hell of a guy, great litigator, still still work with the guy from time to time on a number of cases. And we got this one case, um, big result, big settlement. And um, he bought himself a legal for him with, with, with our attorney fee. We split the attorney fee um, pretty pretty fairly. And he, he went and bought himself a legal four family home in New York City, which I won't tell you what he bought it for, but uh, certainly because I don't want to, I don't want to have any chance of disclosing a settlement. But like today, it's worth probably about four million dollars. And I took my share of that fee, and I went and took ten more employment cases. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you build your way up. You, that, that's what I did. And like it, I, I can, I can say, like, listen, I did right by those clients. Like it went well. Um, looking back, terrifying because if I lost all 10 of those cases, all that money would have been gone. All that money would have been gone. Every last penny from that big settlement we had would have been gone. And that's a good point, Philip. Um, yeah. So, you know, it, it, it's tough. Um, now, if you want to properly fund a case and you're like, you're really looking at taking this case to federal litigation. I would argue you should have 40 to 80 grand in the bank per case. Just the reality. I think that's the kind of bankroll that um, allows you to go hard, right? There's, there's definitely, there's firms that I know who will look at a case and be like, listen, we can tell this client that we can probably get them more at trial, but, um, the settlement that's on offer right now is good. It's not wrong. It's not, it's a good settlement. We just think we can might, might be able to win more at trial. We just don't have the extra 40 grand to go to trial. So we're going to tell the client to take it. That bothers me. Like there's definitely cases where I have to tell people you should take the settlement. Like you don't want to try this case, but like, I shouldn't be the reason that we're giving that advice. Right? Like don't take the case. You can't fund the case unless, unless you have a deal where the client's funding it themselves. That's fine. Like if you're like, listen, I'll put the labor in, but you, you pay the fees. Fine. That's your deal. That's cool. If everything's disclosed and up front, that's totally cool. And there's lots of firms who do stuff like that. I'm saying don't be running around telling people they should settle their case because you can't afford trial. Now it's different than saying, Hey, this case is not worth enough to go to trial. Like, like they're offering you like a hundred cents in the dollar and you're saying no. And we realistically, we don't believe in when you more at trial. That's a different story. That's very different than just being like, listen, I do think you could win more. I think you could win more, but I, I I'm not going to pay for that. I, I, I'm not going to go to trial. Cause I, I don't want to, I don't want to find that extra 40 grand. Right. Like that's a different story. Um,
So like the math, I think, you know, it 40 to 80. Um, all right. We have one last question from YouTube user GB. I'm going to try to answer because I think I've seen this before maybe. And I've never really fully understood. I mean, I know what feudal gesture is, but like in the context, let me, let me read the question out loud and see if I can grapple with it. Hello, Vince. Could you discuss the feudal gesture doctrine? It implies that if an employer consistently denies reasonable accommodation requests, the employee is not obliged to repeatedly request accommodations. Thank you. Okay. So GB, that is true. There's a lot of feudal gestures in our industry, right? There's like, I didn't report sexual harassment because I knew they would just retaliate against me. Or listen, I've seen feudal gestures where like, there's like a history of like somebody reported on a job site, like sexual harassment and like was like physically assaulted. It's like that is more than futile. That is, that is a pattern of retaliation in addition to futility. Like clearly they're not doing right by that person. Right. Um, here you have it specifically in the context of reasonable accommodation. I'm going to be upfront with you. If you come in and you're like, I didn't ask for my reasonable accommodation and they didn't deny my reasonable accommodation, but I don't think I had to ask because they don't usually give reasonable accommodations. Can I start a case? I'm probably going to say to you, can you go ask for that accommodation and get denied? Because that's a much better narrative for your litigation than, hey, it would have been futile for me to ask. That's always going to leave in the mind of the jury the question of, but why didn't they ask? I mean, if that's true, why didn't they ask? Would have taken them like two hours to ask. Get a letter from a doctor. Do it Do it as per best practices. Get a letter from a doctor. Say what you need. Let them say no. Why, why litigate a case, right, with all the expense and risk? and acrimony that that represents and stress and anxiety, right? Why litigate it from an unsound foundation? Why add risk? Well, you could just ask, get denied. It's futile. Okay. Probably. I, I believe you, but, but let's reduce the risk. I hope that's a good discussion of the uh, fetal gesture doctrine. I hope that helps. Um, if you want to Tell me more about what you're looking for. I can try to give you more. I've seen you ask that a couple of times. Um, I hope I hope that was what you're looking for. Oh, okay, if your request was denied several times, so I thought there was like a pattern of denying other people. If your request was denied several times, I'm on board with that. If there, if you're like, I asked for the same thing three times, they denied it three times. I didn't ask it for the fourth. Now I want to litigate. Yes, all in like that. Like I'm, I I would still be like, well, could you paper for me? That would be better. But like, it's not going to keep me from taking that case. I'll tell you that right now. All right. All right, everybody. It is 530 on the dot, almost 529. I'm going to sign off. It is Friday night. I'm going to go uh, have a weekend. Bye, everyone. Like, subscribe, comment down below. It helps me to help more people just like you. Uh, if you share our videos, that also helps our channel to grow, apparently, which is very important because it lets us, again, help more people. Take care, everybody. It was fantastic. I hope you're having a great uh, Thanksgiving weekend. And um, what's, what's the catchphrase? Remember? What's, what's our catchphrase? Everybody works, but not everybody wins. <laughs> Take care, everybody.